to this pretty cool article that I saw on Vox earlier, um, talking about influencers getting rich by teaching you how to get rich, right? And it kind of made me think about what I saw on TikTok recently. I don't really use TikTok that often, but one thing you have to realize with TikTok, which I think they really smashed, is their algorithm is pretty crazy. The algorithm is flipping insane because I feel like anytime you kind of log on to it, they do a good job of pushing all the stuff that's really trending at that moment to you. I remember there was a period in time where for whatever reason, like all these young girls were wearing these particular type of pants, these like flared pattern things. And they were clearly that very thin material, very linen-y type. They'd kind of pull them up their flipping crack, the cracks of their bums and they'd be dancing, you know, f- you know fl- flirtatiously or whatever on the video. And that was like a trend for a while and you couldn't literally, even if you didn't follow any of these people, you didn't like any of it, you couldn't kind of scroll by more than five posts without seeing a post of some young lady, you know, in these really tight flares. So they do a really good job of kind of pushing at that moment. And now it feels like every time I log onto TikTok, the first thing I keep seeing are these like fresh faced, rosy cheeked, under 25 year old looking white dudes talking about the benefits of flipping drop shipping and, you know, Amazon fulfilled by FBA, fulfilled by Amazon and businesses and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, it's just full of, full of it, how easy it is, how much money they're making. And obviously, naturally for me, being a skeptic that I am, the first thing I'm thinking, if, if all you guys are making so much money, why are you teaching everybody to make it? Like, it just doesn't make any sense in that regard. And it's always a course, it feels like. There's always a course that they're selling. It always has to be some sort of course that they're selling to make that make sense. And I think this article kind of speaks on it also. The kind of the these guys, these kids who are becoming wealthy from teaching people how to be wealthy, how to become wealthy, as opposed to actually teach them any skills, as opposed to actually teach them how to make a business. It's kind of like they're all basically selling ebooks about how you can also sell an ebook to be rich, if you kind of get it. But it's just courtesy of Vox. It says, the influencers getting rich by teaching you how to get rich. It starts up as here. Um, the, a digitized woman with long, long, with long blonde hair dancing in front of a black um, spreadsheet. The woman is a 30 year old Kat Norton, better known as Miss Excel, who is in 2020 began going viral for her high energy 15 second TikTok dances superimposed with hacks and navigate the popular dating software Microsoft Excel. Within months, she'd launched her very own digital class accelerator course made up of 100 sub 10 minute video tutorials packaged at a price of $297. Oh my God. Students can complete the tutorials at corresponding workbooks at their own pace on their own time. They chose between the, the original advanced course or shell out 997 for a course on a full Microsoft Office suite, going from a total Excel newbie to a pro in just 12 hours. I don't know how true that is because I'm really crap at Microsoft Excel. I'm not too sure if you guys are, are the same, but Excel has always been my Achilles heel. I'm a freaking savage on Word. I'm a savage on my on flipping PowerPoint. Um, I'm a savage on the other one. What's the other one they used to use? I used to use this other one back in the day for graphic design. I think it was like Publisher and stuff. You can make like leaflets. I remember in, in college, I, was, I, used to, I used to smash Publisher to make like leaflets and posters and stuff. I was really good at it. But when it comes to Excel, I was terrible at doing Excel. But maybe because I'm really terrible at numbers anyway in general. But I'm definitely not a numbers guy. But bloody hell, mate. She must be making bank if she's charging two ninety seven for these courses. But I don't know. But again, I'm I'm not really sure if this is true. Could you go from being a complete noob in Microsoft Excel to a pro in twelve hours? Like, is that possible? Not really too sure. Anyway, it continues. The classes were a hit and practically among her core audience of 25 to 35 year olds who were looking to bulk up their resumes or improve their marketability. Many of them were working from home due to the pandemic and considering a potential career change. And Norton is the platonic example of an online course teacher. She's proficient in all her in-demand skill and perhaps most importantly, she's very good at selling it. Um, but what, But no one, not even Norton, could have predicted what a gold man she stumbled upon. Within two months of opening the course, she says she earned more than um, she earned more from classes sales than she made at her corporate job, which she included many other things, including teaching people how to do Excel. Jesus Christ! Which she's since quit to be Miss Full Excel full time. She now estimates she works about fifteen hours a week, spending the rest of her time exploring the outdoors of Sedona, Arizona, with her boyfriend who handles the sales for the company. So far, they say that she's enrolled more than sixteen thousand people. Um, there have been multiple occasions on which they've brought more than six figures in single day and claims 
confirmed by documentation viewed by Vox. It's when I um, do webinars, she says, and the live classes that those are the massive cash influx days. Oh my God, bruh. She's killing it. And think about this, right? About killing it with these kind of courses. She's absolutely smashing it. Legitimately smashing it. Wow. Um, I think this is a video, right? That she kind of does. Hopefully it doesn't play the music, but let, let's see what, what this what this content looks like. But I imagine it's just like a white girl dancing and with flicking XR things superimposed in the back. Let's see. There it goes. Yeah, XR hacks you don't know about. She's got she's dancing in front of a white background with stuff and showing you all these little hacks and stuff. <laughs> you gotta love the internet, innit? She's making cake off of this nonsense. The dancing is terrible. Like everything about it is go is probably dog dog shit, but people are really getting a lot of credit, a lot of value out of it. I know some people. My, I'm not really the, the guy because I think I usually tend to go on YouTube. But I know a lot of people who like to cook at home, like myself, have now switched to um, having all their tutorials through TikTok. I kind of like the ability to kind of pause easily on my YouTube and shit and rewind a bit, and it's a bit longer and kind of go through that process. But people just want to have short, snappy videos of people making a particular recipe. They'll go to TikTok first as opposed to going to YouTube. Like really strange. I prefer to go to flipping um, um, YouTube personally because it's a bit easier to navigate, and I don't want to have it. I don't want to have jump cuts if I want to make a fucking cookie or some shit. I want it to be able to actually sit down and see it. <laughs> anyway, it, can, it continues here. It says, noted that many other influencers are cashing in on the online course boom, a cottage industry which anyone can learn, uh, money making or otherwise uh, life improving skill. Oh, and that's what I want to say. Sorry, before I move on, I want to say here because there's a bit here that says um, she now works 15 hours a, a week and she's spending the rest of her time exploring the outdoors in Sedona, Arizona with her boyfriend. This is why I say that Tim Ferriss, the author of Four Hour Work Creek, right? Tim Ferriss uh four hour work week this book in my opinion was legitimately one of the most important books i've ever read in my life ever and at the time i felt like he got a lot of unfair stick when this book originally came out i think it might come out what 2007 i think 2007 let me see if i'm from right yeah right i'm, I'm actually right cool 2007 right is the date of publishing of tim ferris's four hour work week and the name of the book i think kind of put people off legitimately put people off and i think it kind of gave it a bit of a bad um uh it kind of gave it a bad image but essentially for our work week it was really like how do you can say it was legitimately like um it was legitimately one of those things that i kind of read at the time that kind of opened my eyes up to the to the ability to the ability of being able to kind of live a life where I don't have to work nine to five for the rest of my life. It kind of opened up that possibility of that, of that being actually within my grasp. And I love the idea behind it because the whole title of four hour work week was a little bit, you know, a little bit deceptive, but the actual premise of the four hour work week was that he wanted you, Tim Ferriss wanted you in this book to learn how to make a business, a muse, I think what it's called in the book, that essentially generated an income for you that you could pay and cover all your necessities and it didn't require you to do more than four hours of work on it to kind of manage it, but then it allowed you the time to then do the things you actually wanted to do, like learning how to salsa, like learning how to learn the language, learning a craft, going back to school, whatever it may be. It just was a way for you to kind of really kind of increase your, your time so that you weren't a slave to your job in terms of converting your eight hours into money. It could kind of open up your flipping time. I think there's a passage in a book about being time rich, about the really wealthy people out there are the ones who basically get to do what they want when they want because they're not kind of bound or kind of locked into a job where they have to be at a certain place at a certain time. And this again was before mass adoption of working from home. This is 20, 2007 where, you know, you don't get to work from home. Working from home is a, it's a real privilege and a real treat and stuff. So him kind of changing people's mindset in that regard was really, really interesting. And I remember when I went to Nicaragua to visit my friend um, that time, and around that time, maybe it was around 20, 2007, 2005-ish. No, maybe 2007, no, maybe 2010 times I went to go visit my friend in Nicaragua. I remember when I went to this really cool hostel somewhere in Leon, one of the cities there, and I bumped into this Brazilian dude who was like, you know, living living the life 
for me anyway out there he was flipping you know golden brown he had a great head of hair he was surfing every day with his, and he had his little dog that he kind of would walk along the beach and run along with surfing chilling eating great you know just looks amazing always funny always a smile on his face and just living life but then I always, whenever I'd ask him what he was doing to kind of sustain his lifestyle, he'd always get a little bit sheepish and don't want to answer. But later on, I found out that what he essentially was doing was basically doing what I'm doing now, where you essentially get to work from home and sort of like, quote unquote, freelance and do loads of like at home, working from home, sort of like customer service, operation, social media managing stuff. That doesn't require you to be in one place at one time. You can kind of be location independent. So he was doing that location dependent stuff in like 2008, 2009, 2010, when I wasn't really aware of it and it wasn't that popular. So he was just, you know, reaping the rewards of it and kind of living this kind of i think at the time they used to call it digital nomad sort of lifestyle and that's what he kind of was over to kind of do so i say all this to say that the four-hour work week really set a precedent back in the day it really kind of set a precedent it kind of um was something that kind of i think was ahead of his time actually let's fact that it was ahead of his time and definitely was ahead of his time and now it looks like these kids are basically doing the same thing they're taking the tenets of the four-hour work week and applying it into the modern age because most of these kids don't want to work right there's loads of articles of kids who are essentially you know against working a regular job they they routinely walk out of jobs if it doesn't suit their needs and shit and all of it is kind of geared towards this idea of kind of you know um all about increasing the lifestyle aspect of it and not trying to kill themselves working nine to fives like probably my generation did but anyway it continues um norton had many influences um at, norton sorry norton and many other influencers are cashing in on the online course boom a cottage industry in which anyone can learn a money making or otherwise life improving skill the microsoft office suite email marketing gut health um equitable sorry household labor how to get tech job and self-confidence from some they already trust um these courses hosted on one of the dozens of make your own course platforms like teachable or kajibi can run from a few hundred bucks to a thousand dollars from a day-long intensive to a months-long course what most of them have in common is that they're undertaken completely independently from the majority of the students that are part of the specific cohort but can sign up as a complete work as itself it makes sense then why so many of these classes have become businesses uh, are about business sorry even online courses devoted to boosting your confidence are pretty explicitly geared towards improving one's marketability the online course creator is distinctly the american character one who teaches um preaches sorry that the sun some rest way to find financial stability self-employment and more important than any other singular interest science um art or music or sports or whatever is your ability to sell to everyone else so this really strange kind of like push that they're kind of having online where everyone has to be an entrepreneur is interesting, but I do like this kind of aspect of it where it's sort of like, on, it's kind of like a lifestyle entrepreneur. It's not like actually being like a, you know, like a actual serial entrepreneur where you're, you, you can't stop making businesses. You're always trying to sell. You're always trying to, you know, build something to sell it to a big corporation. And you're kind of in that kind of game. It's about just allowing people the lifestyle that they want where they don't have to be kind of bound to the idea of working a nine to five but i also do think it kind of misses the point because i think most people just want to earn a bit more money or they want to have their money go a bit more further so maybe they had this idea that they want to start a business they want to have a side hustle but once you start doing you start realizing how hard it is <coughs> you start thinking oh actually maybe some people are cut out to be pretty good employees there's nothing wrong with being a really good employee and kind of smashing it in that way and becoming a really valuable member of a team. Being a really good number two to somebody is just as good as actually starting your own company. So I don't know. I'm a little bit dubious of this kind of trend because I feel like a lot of the kids out there maybe need that other side of the conversation to be spoken about also. Anyway, you could really, you could, if you really wanted to, write off an influencers on any courses as a cynical cash grabs by people who know their followers will fork uh, over any amount of money um, for their tutelage. But that wouldn't tell the whole story. The travel YouTuber Damon Dominique's foreign language courses, for instance, are full of funny, beautifully edited videos in which he teaches students conversational French or Spanish, intersped with inter entertaining stories about his escapades hitting on men at European raves. Like Norton of Miss X. So Dominique already had a background in language teaching but decided to launch a course where the pandemic made it difficult to film travel videos. For creators like Dominique, online courses are a welcome respite from the erratic, unpredictable nature of making content on or on internet platforms. It says, 
there's a change in the algorithm every two months oh that's a good point i didn't think about actually there's a change in the algorithm every few months and right now it's all moving towards short form video um it took him about six months to organize film edit and or, and and edit a course offered on a digital course platform teachable which like most course platforms takes either a percentage of the revenue cost um, of a creator a few thousand per year to use depending on which pricing model they chose so far more than five thousand people have taken his 199 french course five thousand people taking online french courses and the funny thing about it right is that most likely i it would imagine it would i would imagine that most of these people have probably learned way more from this kid's french courses than they would have learned in school most likely they've definitely learned more i mean that's the kind of gut-wrenching part of it like even for me like i remember you know when i started realizing oh shit i actually always did like history even though i was a bad student at school with it i used to flip in love history in school but it was it was teach it was taught really terribly but then when i found like hardcore history and other history-based podcasts and shit during the time that i found it i suddenly realized that yeah i could sit down and listen to a six hour plus you know epilogue on fucking genghis khan because i legitimately was interested in it and because the way that it was being taught or it was being explained to me by that guy um that does hardcore history it definitely did kind of resonate a lot more so um that's a really scary part and really sad thing about these sort of things you could spend five years in school learning french not learn a single lick of it but then you pay this kid 200 dollars, and then it legitimately teaches you something that you can actually use on your little parisian trip and and it actually kind of reignites this desire for you to learn languages and who knows by the end of the year you might be going to some other places too on the back of it so but yeah exactly the, the, the dan carlin yeah exactly that's the guy mr singh dan carlin absolutely top 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 man i love dan carlin man um i, I wish he would 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 um restart his podcast too i think it's called making sense the one where he just talks about just like regular news and politics and stuff i know he gets bummed out about li doing it and stuff because you know he gets a little bit too hard into it and kind of you know it can get a bit conspiratorial but i did enjoy them um anyway it continues teachable doesn't consider itself a replacement for higher education per se but it does hope to supplement it people never go to college so it says most people never go to college and they need a solution that works for them and their life explained teachable general manager mark hassel team the challenge with traditional education is so expensive and it's on the school's time not the individual's time a lot of professors are more concerned about their own reputation influences he argues are experts are engaging with their audience who in turn trust them to educate in a way that they're already familiar with academics however don't always see the influences as the best professors some of these influences do the legitimate training in the field and some do not but they are able to position themselves in the credible as experts by using the acceptable boundaries or patterns of communication or authenticity, said Emily Hund, a research affiliate at the Central Digital Culture and Society at the University of Pennsylvania, Annenberg School of Communication. Bloody hell, what a title of a school, innit? That's sometimes that's probably what they do, innit? They just they just have these long falutin names for schools to make you feel like you're actually doing something credible with your life. Uh, the Center on Digital Culture and Society at the University of Pennsylvania Annenberg School of Communication. Like, God damn it. Anyway, in the realm of parenting stuff, um, there are so many people selling parenting courses from every possible angle. On one hand, it's great when it comes from an actual trained psychologist because now more people can access the helpful tips. On the other hand, every day you're getting content about what might go wrong with your kid. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's like going on WebMD to see if you've got a really bad cough. Don't go on WebMD. Don't do it under any circumstances. It continues. Um, it creates a this stranger dynamic that shifts to selling ways of thinking and ways of approaching the world. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed. I'm not going to read the whole entire thing, but I think it's really, really cool what we're seeing at the moment. Um, influencers taking learning into their own hands. I hold cohort of fans basically buying onto it, and I think like most of these things online even if it is a bit scammy i think most people will sniff it out so even if you, the person is able to kind of run off on them plug and make a bit of money i think in the long term it probably benefits them if they're actually legit because they'll get a lot of returning customers they'll get a lot of people eulogizing and evangelizing for their works so they won't have to advertise in the slightest because word of mouth will tell people hey go to this guy he does really good spanish courses go to this person he does really good you know basic electrician house maintenance type of courses those type of things exist so it's kind of within their 
it's within their best interest to kind of provide a good service, a good product, so they have people kind of returning and coming back. So it's not just a one-off, one-time purchase type of thing. So I do like seeing it, but I do think it's funny to see some of the guys and gals who are doing the whole, I'll teach you how to get rich by teaching you how to make another ebook to get rich again. Do you know what I mean? I love all that stuff. I really do love that stuff. I think it's absolutely hilarious.